Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate everyone showing up here in service. I think in service is always special. Amen. And those that are watching us online, uh, we have a bunch of people that watch in our online campus every week, and, and we thank you for joining us. And every week we're praying for whoever's here, whoever's watching, whoever participates. And our prayer is that you'll just be encouraged and inspired to live for Jesus. It's all about Jesus, just encouraged and inspired. Um, let me, let me, we're going to take up a missions offering in just a minute. Uh, let me, they're going to put some slides up. Um, first of all, the youth, our, our student ministry is having a pool party tonight. And you can, that should have a, a code on there. You can scan that with your phone and register them. And that, it'll give you the address and everything where it's at. So that's good. And how many of you participated in the bowling event last month? Y'all are really quiet about that. Thank you. You enjoyed it. No, we, we had about a, a, a little over 100 people that showed up to go bowl. And so we're doing these family, these free family nights. So it was free. Everyone got to bowl for free. And next Sunday, we're having a skate night. We've rented out a skating rink. And so we control the music. And um, so basically, that tells you what's not going to be played, okay? <laughs> And, uh, but anyway, listen, uh, it, and what we do is, uh, you don't have to skate. I mean, when we have the whole place, you have a snack bar, you can come and just w get your video camera out and watch people fall. It's always really fun. <laughs> people who used to at one time could really skate can no longer do that. And then we have, we bring oil and we pray for people as they're leaving, you know, because they're going to be sore. But that's next Sunday. It would help us. Just go uh, click on that code there and you can register. And uh, this morning, um, as the guys come up to help us with missions offerings. So here at Family Life, if you notice, we don't take up offerings every Sunday. We teach our members to tithe, and you can do that online. There's a kiosk out there in the lobby. There's boxes on the wall if, if you're old school and, and write checks and all that. However you do that, we appreciate that. But every year, Family Life gives at least 10%. Sometimes it's more like 20% to, our, to mission pro projects, local missions, overseas missions, and... And uh, today, today, um, I'm really excited because uh, we, ha we have uh, several missionaries that are here in Family Life. And so uh, Terry, Terry and Ty Hensley have started a mission work in Vietnam. So we have people from our own congregation leading a, a, a mission effort in Vietnam. This will be their third year to do that. And they're going to play a quick minute and a half video to kind of give you a little bit more of an idea about it. Then we'll take up an offering for them. Hello, everyone. Terry and I are happy that the Rice for is returning to Vietnam this fall. COVID-19 affected the whole world. It especially affected countries like Vietnam that depend on tourism for their livelihood. We were heartbroken to cancel Ride for Ride. We felt we had a lot of battle to evil. Through prayer and God's guidance, good can overcome evil. And what better time is there to spread the good news than at Christmas time? This Christmas Drive for Ride will reach out to five churches in Vietnam. We will distribute 500 copies of the Vietnamese Bible, along with 500 of our signature food gifts. We will begin on December the 15th, early enough. To have the food distributed on time for Christmas. But wait, that's not all. One month later, we'll do it all again. We'll reach out to another five churches in time to have the food and the Bibles into another 500 homes by the Lunar New Year. How about it? Will you support us in taking the good news to Vietnam? You can visit us at riseforprise.com and God bless you. And so basically what they do is they partner with local churches and they, they supply food for a family for a week and they give a Vietnamese Bible and then the churches are able to follow up with them and you know, each year they're learning 
you know, how to do it better. And we believe this year that there's just going to be a massive amount of, of people come to Jesus. And so we had raised all the money to fund them at the end of 2020. And of course, they weren't able to go because of COVID. So this year, they're going to go, they're going to be gone for three months. They're going to they're do the end of the year in December. They're going to do the distribution and the Bibles and all that. Then I believe at the end of January or 1st of February, at lo the Lunar New Year, they're going to do it again in a different part of Vietnam. And so, uh, you know, we're, you know, we're going to, we, we support them. And I, I can't remember the number. I think we need to raise $3,500 to get them on their way to do everything. But uh, this is going to be a blessing. So, Lord, we, we're thankful for the opportunity to give. Lord, we're thankful that we've been blessed. God, we're thankful uh, that we have people from our congregation going to win souls in Thai's home of Vietnam. Lord, we're so thankful for that. We're thankful for their willing spirit to do that. And God, we, we want to send them out with joy. We want to send them out fully funded. So God, I pray you take this offering, you multiply it. And, and I pray that through this offering, many souls are coming to Jesus this year in the first part of next year. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. While they're doing that, I'm going to talk to you just for a minute. I'm assuming that you can g take money out of your pocket and give it and listen to me at the same time. We have a smart congregation. Um, so, you know, w here at Family Life, we, we don't believe you do something because you've always, you've always done it. We believe you do things that are effective. And so uh, our church is going through some changes here, and we're, we're trying to, to focus on some things that we think will better uh, better help us disciple people and reach people. So on August 18th, at the end of summer, we're going to change some things up, and we're going to start a Wednesday midweek service. Every, every Wednesday night, we'll have a midweek service, and our youth ministry, which is meeting while I speak, uh, will begin to meet again on Wednesday night. So parents, you can come drop your kids off. There's a place for you to come and worship. And, uh, you know, we're calling it a believer service because... Uh, you, you know, we just don't have enough church today. We just, we just don't, you know. And let's face it, we have it just on Sunday. And I'm not being harsh, but uh, not everyone makes it every Sunday, right? Things happen. And so uh, we're going to start a Wednesday. And the goal of Wednesday is to disciple people. We're going to do books of the Bible. We're going to do all kind of things and, um, that just help people grow. And so that's coming up here in, in, in about a month. Um, and so I also want you to know that of course, we started doing the youth on Sunday instead of Wednesday because no one would come on Wednesday. And so we figured, well, at least some of them will come with their parents and, of course, during COVID. But, you know, they go back there for 40 minutes while I teach, but it's not enough time to do the program they need to do. So, you know, starting in, in, in uh, August, they'll have, you know, some of the, our youth are going to start leading worship over there and they'll have time to do the whole program. So uh, I hope that you will join us and participate with that. And on that, all the students can be released. You know, just, if, if you don't know, um, you know, our students, every, every week they go back there and they have a lesson broken down for them on their level. And we deal with all kind of things that are, that are hitting our teenagers. And uh, so, I, you know, um, the tough thing about teenagers is they can't drive themselves. So they actually need you to come and bring them. So I challenge parents on that. All right. I promised I was going to be nice today, so we're going to move on. But our students are so important, and we, have, we care about them, and we want to disciple them, but you got to get people there to disciple them, you know? Uh, so anyway, I'm starting a new series today, and this series is called Paradox. And uh, if you don't know what a paradox is, let me start by defining paradox. Paradox, if you go to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, paradox is this. It's an assertion or sentiment seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense, but may in fact be true. It's a statement that appears to be illogical, even absurd, yet it is true. Now, how many of you, when you became a Christian, you started talking differently, you started acting differently, and your parents thought you had lost your mind? You know, well, it, there's, there's a paradox here. There's different paradigms. So let me give you some, some examples of paradoxes in the natural wor world. Here's some statements that would be paradoxes. 
You save money by spending it. That didn't make sense. But I promise you, if you take your car in for, for maintenance, it lasts longer. If you just drive it, drive it till it won't drive anymore, there's a problem. It's going to cost you more. So you spend some money on the front end, but they actually save money later on. Uh, here, here's another one. If I know one thing, it's that I know nothing. There's a lot of people that don't get that statement right there. They, they think they know it all, right? Uh, this is the beginning of the end. That's a paradox. Well, are we at the beginning or are we at the end, you know? Well, it's the beginning of the end, right? Uh, and here's another one. Deep down, you were really a shallow person. <laughs> Think about that. Okay. When we go to the spiritual world, when we think about the Bible and our Christian lives, the whole Christian life is a paradox. The whole Christian life is a paradox. And all the major spiritual principles that we're supposed to live by are paradoxes. And that is, in the natural realm, they seem foolish. But in reality, they work. And, and this is why many times people don't obey the Bible. This is why many times Christians, even who read the Bible, are scared to obey it because in the natural, it doesn't make sense. It, it, just, it just doesn't make sense. But when you follow it, it, it works. And you know, it may seem impractical. So let me give you some paradox in the Bible. You have to lose your life to gain it. Well, what does that mean? You have to surrender your life to Jesus, and Jesus comes in and fills you with everything you need, and your life gets better. Well, that's a paradox. That's a paradox. It's better to give than receive. Well, yeah, why? Why is that? Because when you give, something happens inside of you. Uh, something uh, bubbles up in, into life. Less is more. The principle of simplicity found in the Bible. You know, what, what, did, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, hey, you're worried about all these things. You're worried about all these things. You're worried about what you're going to do, what you're going to wear, how you're going to pay for things. But what did Jesus say? Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be taken care of. Simplicity is more. It's a paradox. Uh, the Bible says that we're supposed to live by faith and not by sight. I mean, sometimes we need to go through life, we just need to get, get us a service dog and put blinders on our eyes, right? Because what we're seeing doesn't look so good. Well, we're not, we're not living. We're not acting. We're not, we're not uh, you know, just tied to what we see because there's supernatural principles underlying uh, our lives. And Here's another one, the, the Sabbath rest, that by taking one day to rest your body and mind, you'll be more productive in life. And, and, and many aren't doing that. We're running, 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 and, uh, and, and until we, you know, we, we run our bodies like we run our cars, like I talked about a while ago. We run them, and eventually your body will demand rest. Eventually your body will shut down. So what I'm going to do these next few weeks is I'm going to take some of the bigger, the larger paradoxes in the Bible, and we're just going to break them down for you, just real simple. These, these teachings are real simple. You probably know some of, this, some of this before, but the problem is we're not doing it. We've got to do it. We've got to do these things. So today it's the paradox of humility, and the title is this, The Way Up is Down. My pastor, Brother Francis, uh, Wrote, wrote a book, and the book is The Way Up is Down. It's a book on humility. I was at a conference with him one time, and this, of course, there's a lot of people there, and I was probably one of the only ones that knew he had written a book on humility, and the speaker, the speaker said, you know, some people are so humble that they even write books on humility. <laughs> he laughed and said, yeah, it sold a bunch of copies too. <laughs> so today we're going to look at the paradox of humility and the deception of pride. Now, I know, I know what you're thinking. I don't have a problem with pride. Well, l l let's go through the Bible first. Let's, let's, let let's see what the Holy Spirit reveals to you. Because sometimes, sometimes uh, pride can be hiding in places, uh, you know, that we don't look for. Sometimes when we're filled with pride, Pride brings a deception and we can't see the reality of where, of where we're at. So the Bible says something that is shocking to us. It's really shocking. It says that the way to make it to the top, to be the best that we can be, to live a life to the fullest is, is to live 
with humility. And this is a paradox because it, it defies human logic in what we're conditioned to believe from society, by our culture. See, we're told, this is what society tells us, that to be the best, to make it to the top, you have to be tough, you have to be cutthroat, you have to look out for your own interests. We are told to look at everything as a stepping stone to something greater. And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says by living with humility, you can get anywhere you need to be in life. But living by humility, you don't have to be mean to other people. You can get where you need to be in life and so can everyone around you. You don't have to cut someone off. Someone doesn't have to fail for you to succeed. And, but society is ingrained. And I'm telling you, we, we've been talking about this. I've mentioned it several times, but society today is just cruel. It's terrible. You know, people think for me to win an election, I just have to totally assassinate all these other people, you know, or, or I put dirt out on people that may or may not be true. And, and it's filtered down into our society to the, to the place to where if someone doesn't agree with you, they can't be friends. Listen, if you have humility in your heart, you can get along with anybody. Now, you'll like some better than others. But you can get along with anyone if you, if you have humility. Many times humility is considered a weakness instead of a strength. You know, again, we're told nice guys get left behind. They get used and discarded while the proud and arrogant climb the ladder of success. Well, let's look at what Jesus says about this. We're going to look at a lot of scripture today in the next few weeks. Luke 14, verse 7 through 11. And in Jesus, many times, he taught by the things that were just happening in life. And, and he's talking about a wedding feast here. He says, if someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place, and then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. And then it says this, this is Jesus speaking, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And we have to ask ourselves a question, who do we want to exalt us? That's a question I mean, on that. Do you want to be exalted by society? Do you want to be exalted by your job? Do you want to be exalted by people? Or do you want God to exalt you? When we place ourselves and live in humility and God begins to exalt us, I'm telling you, there's nothing that any human force can do to stop it. When God begins to exalt you, you're blowing by people. You're, you're, you're getting places that you never thought you would get. And so again, the question is this, who do you want to exalt you? See, a lot of people want to exalt themselves, which is basically the definition of pride. Peter says this in 1 Peter 5, verse 5 through 6. It says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. I've done a whole series on favor. When you have the favor of God in your life, it's a game changer. It is a game changer. But if you're prideful, God's favor can't be upon your life. If you want to do it on your, on your own and, and live in a prideful way, you're blocking the favor of God and so many other things from, from pouring into your life. It says, humble yourselves therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he, again, he may lift you up in due time. One more scripture, Proverbs 29, 23, it says, pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. Humility, so let, let's define these. Humility really is, is, is to have a modest spirit or a modest view of yourself. To have a lowly or submissive spirit, to place yourself below others, and to kind of be level-headed, just to be level-headed. Pride, 
Uh, pride simply means to be inflated with conceit, to be puffed up or high-minded, to be delusional, to be enveloped by smoke. When you're, when you're consumed by pride, you can't even see how you're treating other people. You can't even see what's going on. It's like you're, you're in a cloud of smoke and you're blinded from reality. Henry Courtney said this, the bigger a man's head gets, the easier it is to fill his shoes. An un unknown author, he wrote this. He said, when you're on your high horse, the best thing to do is to dismount at once. So if you're on your high horse, dismount. Because if you don't do it yourself, God will allow things in life to dismount, to help you dismount. Amen? Or to be kicked off. I don't any of you been kicked off a horse before? I, I haven't, but you know, in America's Funniest Videos, it looks pretty funny, you know, if it's not you. It's not fun. Humil humility and pride, I want you, humility and pride, both of them, have divine promises. In humility, the divine promise is this. If, if, if you live a life of humility, God will exalt you. He will lift you up. He will put you where you need to be. And pride also has a divine, has a divine promise, which is this, that God opposes the proud. And, and, and he, will, he will oppose your efforts, and he will make sure you get to a place of humility. Proverbs 22, 4, it says this, Humility is the fear of the Lord. Listen, it's, it's wages. Humility has wages. It pays wages. And the wages are riches, honor, and life. Riches, wealth, honor, to have a good reputation with people, and, and life. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. In Proverbs 26, 12, it says this. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. That is, that is the staggering verse right there. And in the Bible, a fool is a person who never learns lessons who never increases their knowledge, they repeat the same folly over and over and over. They just, they, it's just a, a repetition of things. So, he, you know, he says, Solomon says this, if you see someone that's wise in their own eyes, that, that's prideful, there's more hope for someone that's been labeled a fool than for them. Again, these are some, these are some tough things to swallow. So what, what are some signs of humility? Well, what are signs that you, you're living a humble life? And what, what are some signs? And um, I, th I thought of a few. The first one is this. One sign of humility is when you don't have to defend yourself. And now, you know, whenever I speak a message, people always come up to me with these and or buts. But what if someone takes you to court? Well, you know, get your lawyer and defend yourself. But I'm talking about just everyday things. See, a lot of times we're even wrong in what happened and we still want to defend ourselves. What, what are you scared of? You scared of being wrong? You scared of having to apologize? I mean, that, that, that's pride if you have to always, see pride always wants to make a defense to prove that you're right. And, and it's actually our natural instinct to defend ourselves. It's very interesting. In Matthew 26, 62, Jesus was, was arrested in the garden and he was brought before the Sanhedrin, which is uh, basic, ba basically it's the high council of the Jewish nation, 70 elders. He's brought before the Sanhedrin and they bring all these people in to make false accusations about Jesus. So everything they're saying is not true. And Jesus didn't defend himself. He didn't say a word. Why, why didn't he say a word? Well, everyone in the room knew that they were lying. Everyone knew, in the room knew that they had paid these people to come make false accusations, that it was a trumped up or worked up charge. And Jesus is like, why am I going to waste my breath? And so a lot of times when we're trying to defend ourselves, it doesn't even matter if you do it well. I mean, how many, of you, how many of you know people that even if they know the truth, they're still going to think what they think? See, now you're with me. I finally got you. You're with me. You're with me. 
So, but again, a lot of, a lot of times, and, and I'm not saying if you defend yourself that one time it's prideful, but I'm just saying if you have the habit, you know, you're married, you're married, and you're having arguments, and both people are butting heads. Why are you both butting heads? Here's an actual thing that I've learned in marriage counseling. See, we, we, we argue because we think one person is right. That's not necessarily true. Sometimes you both have a partial bit of the truth. <laughs> when, I, when I was a youth pastor, parents would come to me. We had, I, we, it was a large church, had a lot of kids, and parents would call me up and, oh, this person did such and such to, to Susie and this and that. And so I talked to this other person. All right, well, that's not the way it happened. So I would always have, I call it the day of truth. I bring both students and both sets of parents in. And it was a liberating day for those parents. Because what their child had told them, not one time in four years did any of the parents or the students act actually 100% of what they said or believed was true. Okay, so we don't have to defend ourselves. The second sign of humility is that you're teachable. That, that you're teachable. And teachable means that you put yourself around people who know more than you. I don't know about you, but I don't need to hang around people all the time that know less than me. I want to hang around people that are better than me, that are, have knowledge that I haven't gained yet, and I want to learn from them, that you're, you're, you're teachable. But, you know, some, some people, some people are, are, not, are not teachable. No, let me rephrase that. A lot of people are not teachable. And if you have someone that's willing to pour into your life and if you're teachable, man, you can grow leaps and bounds. So what keeps you from being teachable? One of the main culprits is pride. One of the main culprits is pride. So we had, um, we, we used to have, before COVID, we had several church that, churches that were startup churches and they used our small building over there. We let them use it because they didn't have a place to meet and I was there, I was, I'm a church planner. We started this church with just a few people in our home, we were renting buildings, and so I'm like, man, if we can help people, we're just gonna help people. And the, one of the pastors, he was just, he'd never started church before, he'd never been a pastor before, and he said, man, pastor, I need your help. And I told him this, I, I will be happy to help you, but if you're not teachable or you don't wanna listen to any of my insight, I'm not gonna waste my time. And so he came over one time and, and like I knew the answer to what he asked me, but he didn't like my answer. So that's okay, I just, I, I, I withdrew, I don't have time. But I'm telling you, when you get around somebody, and here's what I've learned, a lot of people like to mentor people. And people that have gained a lot of success, know a lot of things, they're happy to pour into people, they just wanna know that the people will listen, that you'll listen. Number three, that you're, you're, not, you're not critical of people. And I actually, being critical, some of it is pride. A lot of being critical is insecurity. Insecurity. You're insecure in who you are, and so you have to try to make people bring them lower to make yourself feel better. And so that's, that's not a good thing. Uh, the, the next one is, when you, can, when you can admit you're wrong, pride doesn't allow someone to ever, to some people to ever admit that they're wrong. And I, I've, talked to, I've talked to people who've told me that maybe someone in their life, a family member or a friend, a boss, whatever, said, man, I've been knowing them for years and years and they've never admitted they're wrong, not one time. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm wrong several times a week. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm being humble, I should say every day, but you know. Uh, but I like, sometimes I'm wrong, you know? And sometimes, sometimes I, you know, I have to apologize to my kids because, um, you know, it's like, man, I was a little sharp there, shouldn't have done that. Um, I would apologize to Tracy, but I just never make mistakes in that area, so. I just acted like some of you. <laughs> Set you up on that one. So now we've talked about these are some signs of humility. Now, see, here's what we do in America. We, 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 to do something, we, we make a list of pros and cons. We, we make a list of 
to do something, why it's important that we do it. If, we're gonna, if we have a choice between two jobs, okay, which one has the best pay? Which one has the best hours? Which one has the best retirement plan? Which one has the best, best health plan? That's how we, we, we decide. And many times when it comes to the Bible, there's something we need to do and we just don't have the discipline or we, we, we really don't have the motivation to do it. And what I wanna show you today is if we can change if we can change from being prideful in certain areas, if we can bring true Bible humility into our lives, there's some benefits that come along with it. And we're gonna name some of those today. The first one is this, is that humility protects us from sin. Humility protects us from sin. Jonathan Edwards, the, the, the famous pre preacher said this, the best defense that anyone can have against the wiles of the devil is a humble heart. Nothing sets a person so much out of Satan's reach as humility. Humility is a great protection against falling headlong into Satan's traps. And besides, it's hard to fall down when you're already prostrate before God. And we spend more time on our knees, you know, you're not, we're not going any lower than that, and that's going to that's gonna bring us up. So, so many times, Satan comes at us and, and tempts us with, with prideful things. And he uses pride to throw us off track and humility is a great weapon against sin. In, in, in Luke 4, we know that uh, Jesus goes out into the desert and he, he's fasting. And at the end of, end of his fast, when he, his, his body's weak, when he's tired, the devil comes at him three times trying to tempt him to sin. And, and one of those times it says this, Luke 4, 5, 3, the devil led him, Jesus, up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor because it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And see, he, 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 was, he was appealing to pride when he told Jesus, look, if, if you bow down and worship me, all, see all this stuff? This all belongs to me right now. And I will give it all to you. Well, you know, fortunately for Jesus, he had no pride in him, right? And, 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 but again, and so sometimes, sometimes some of the sins we fall into they're, they're, they're based on our pride. And the devil uses our pride against us to tempt us in areas that, quite honestly, if, if there was humility there, there would be no temptation to do certain activities, certain behaviors. Uh, number two, humility keeps us from being offended. It keeps us from being offended. So what I'm saying is, if you get offended by everyone, if you get offended a lot, it, the bottom line of that, a lot of it's pride. A lot of it's pride. And uh, see, we, we can, a lot of people aren't boisterous and loud and all this. You can, you can, you can be a quiet person and be filled with pride. Okay? And some, sometimes the, the extroverts, the loud people get all the attention, but some people get offended. Luke 17, 1 says this, it's impossible Again, Jesus said it is impossible. It's not possible to go through life without offenses coming, without things happening to you that may cause you to be offended. And you know, we, you know, we, we say things like, man, I can't believe they said that to me. I can't believe they said that to me. And you're going to a family reunion, you say that about 13 times, right? I can't believe, I can't, can't believe, you know? I can't believe they said that to me. I can't believe I wasn't invited to attend this event. Um, I can't believe they didn't remember my name. I mean, we, we, have, we have all these things. You may, you may have your own, uh, but we have become a nation that's so easily off offended. And then we respond on that. And what I tell you, what you don't understand, actually John Bevere wrote an incredible book on offenses and it's called The Bait of Satan. The Bait of Satan. And it's, it, it's, it's the monkey and the banana. You ever seen the thing where there's a jar and the monkey can get his hand in the jar 
to grab the banana, but he can't get the banana out. That's what happens when you allow yourself to become offended. You, you don't move on the same. You know, if you get offended at a church, you're going to take that offense to your next church. If you get offended in relationships, you're going to take that to your next relationship. And the only way you can leave it behind is, is forgiveness. But, I mean, again, we, we've, we've become offended. And, and I'm gonna, that, that's a big part of my testimony because I was raised in church. My dad was a pastor. And when I went in the military at 18, I said, man, I, I don't want anything to do with church. Those people are crazy. That's what I said. Those people are crazy. I watched people that my dad was trying to help come back and say things about him, spread rumors about him. I'm like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. In the day, at a turning point in my life, I was, sitting, I was sitting in a physics class at Texas State University with about 250 other students. And, and I wasn't happy and I was struggling with things. And you know, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Terry, if you were doing what I had asked you to do, you'd be happy right now. And I'm like looking around because it just blew me up, you know, I'm like, whoa. Calling me out in front of 250 people. And that whole class, I didn't hear one thing that was said, and the Lord dealt with me the whole time. And my biggest thing was that I was so worried about other people. That's why I'm always saying, don't worry about other people, worry about you. That's what God did. He blew me. Terry, you're worried about all these other things people have done. What about you? You're not doing what I've asked you to do. Worry about you. Focus on you, and you won't have time to get offended. See, offense is when we're worried about everyone else. Worry about yourself. And I'm telling you, it, it, was a start, it was a starting point to a revolution in my life. And, you know, but some people, they just continually, they're offended by everything. You got to let that go. That's pride to some degree. That's pride. Let it go. And let God just, just deal with you. I'll never forget, we were, we were a, a small, we were just beginning, and we had this couple that started coming to the church, and we were meeting in a kids or kids daycare. I don't know if you've ever been in a kids or kids daycare. They're all glass. They're all glass. You can stand at one side and see all the way through, and of course it's that way for, uh, you know, for purpose, for security purposes and all that. And so we had this one lady that's coming to church, and she was always offended about something, you know? And like we only had 15 people coming, so I really didn't want her to leave. But she's offended every, like every week. And so one time her husband comes to me and he says, Pastor, you know, my wife is offended, um, you know, b because you, you don't talk to her. She comes in and you talk to everybody else and you don't talk to her. I said, my gosh, I talk to everybody. Again, we have 15 people, 15 adults. And I said, Tracy is right. And she said, no. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to stand in the front of the, the, the daycare, and when she comes in, I'm going to greet her and talk to her. I, 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 my wife says I exaggerate or not a lot, but if you ask her, this is true. She was there. This is no, there's no exaggeration here. She comes in, and I'm like, we're, we're locked in right there, you know. I'm like, you can't get past me. We're going to talk right here, you know. And she turns and starts going down the hallway. Again, I'm an extrovert. I'm a type A person. So I'm just, I'm just following her. She's walking the hallway. You got, we got to meet sometime. Come on. What you going to, you know, where are you going to go? Come on. I'm just, come on. We're going to talk today, you know. And I'm like, this is, this is insane. This is insane. And again, when you become offended and over and over and over again, you start becoming paranoid and delusional. Everyone's out to get you. Everyone's out. No. So we, we, we can't, you know, humility keeps us from being offended. Humility says, you know, maybe they've had a bad day. I should just let it go. Maybe they didn't mean it to sound that way. Or you didn't get invited somewhere. Great, I can stay at home and watch a movie. I, I don't, you know, or I don't know. Anyway, just a thought. Number three, humility Humility brings grace into your life. Proverbs 3.34, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Grace is a wonderful thing when you're not perfect. 
You know what grace is? Grace is when God gives you something that you don't deserve. Mercy is when he withholds something that you deserve. So grace is when God just blesses us with things even though we're not perfect. And if, if you're not a perfect person, I'm pretty sure no one in here, I'm sure everyone here is close to perfect, but you're not there yet. If you're not perfect, you need God's grace upon your life. You need to extend grace to other people because you need grace from them. What you sow, you reap. If you sow grace and give people the benefit of the doubt, that's what you will receive, you know, one day. So ho hopefully you give it out as well as receive it. Uh, I was thinking about a story this week. And when I, was in, when I was in high school, I went to the church school, a Christian school. And I, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm, I'm, I was somewhat of a rebellious child, okay? I was somewhat of a rebellious teenager. And yeah, it's true. I know. It's, I know. Because I had all these things going on in me, you know? I was a pastor's child, and I see all these things. Unfortunately, you see the best of church and the worst church. I had all these things going on, on, on inside of me. So me and it, this one, I, so I got in trouble a lot is what I'm saying. You know how back then they could paddle you? and had a big old paddle. You could write your name on it. Well, mine's there with some. It's there, right? So one day at the end of the day, I got in trouble for something. I can't remember what it was. And my, print, my teacher was Mr. Offenberger. And I tell my dad, he, this guy has it out for me. He does not like me, you know, which was true, but I made his life miserable, you know. And, um, and so I got in trouble, so I'm like, man, okay, tomorrow he's going to light me up. Tomorrow I'm getting swats. Tomorrow it's on. So I said, okay, I, you know, I have to laugh somehow. I have to laugh at him no matter how hard he hits me. So I'm telling you, I wore like eight pairs of pants underneath my pants. I mean, I put shorts on, cotton, I put everything in there. And I went up to my friends and say, do I look unnatural, you know? They're like, Terry, you look huge, man. Had sweat running down my legs all day. He waited until the end of school. And he came up to me and he said, hey, Terry, I'm going to give you grace this time. I don't want grace. Bring it on. I've done this all day. <laughs> and so maybe he knew. But do you know that that was a turning point in our relationship? Because I'm like, man, he gave me grace. He gave me grace. So uh, in, in we're, we're friends today and stuff, but it was a turning point in our relationship when he gave me grace. I didn't deserve it. And he just did it anyway. Now, he, he, it would have been better if he had given me grace at 8 in the morning when I first got to school, but he waited till 3. Number four, humility brings wisdom into our lives. Proverbs 13, 11, 2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Pride puffs up and it blinds us from the truth. Pride... Pride makes us unteachable and gives us a false sense of wisdom. When we walk in humility, it allows us to learn from others. It allows us to hear the voice of God. All these things open up with humility. Because when we have humility operating in our lives, we know we need outside help. We know we need to hear God's voice. We know we need good people around us that can help us out. And a pride blocks that. Humility releases the floodgates of wisdom. It really does. Last thing, number five. Humility brings wealth, honor, and life. Proverbs 22, 4, it says this. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. Again, we read that earlier. It's wages. Humility has a wage. If you live a humble life, it pays you a dividend. It pays you a wage. Riches or wealth, honor, and life. So common sense would say that humility does not produce wealth, honor, and life. But that's why we're doing this series on paradoxes in the Bible. There are so many incredible, powerful principles in the Bible that just don't seem to make sense in the natural realm but that's okay because God doesn't live in the natural realm. He lives in the supernatural, the supernatural realm. You know, pride tells us that, again, we have to do it ourselves. We have to be aggressive. You have to fight for everything 
that you get. And the Bible tells us that we can live with humility and let God exalt us. It's a lot easier if you let God do the work beside yourself. And don't get me wrong, God's gonna require some things of you to be blessed. I'm not saying you can be lazy and be blessed, but I'm saying sometimes we're working so hard trying to get there. We're working so hard and, and we're trying to do it on our own. And, and God says, man, you know, the way up is down. The way up is you stay down, you stay filled with humility and I will bring you up. So the first paradox we tackle is the paradox of humility. The way up is down. The way to be exalted, the path to riches, honor, and life are found when we lower ourselves and become submissive to God and those around us. Would you, would you stand with me this morning? God, we come before you today. And Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you're just speaking to the lives of your people this morning. God, we're in desperate need of your presence. And Lord, I think this is a word for your church. This is a word for people, Christians living everywhere, that the way up is down. Society doesn't say that, doesn't live by that. But Lord, the paradox in the Bible is that humility can bring honor. Humility can bring success. Humility allows God to exalt us. You know, if this message touched your life in any way and there's something like, man, Terry, I need God to help me with this. There's an area of my life that I need to bring under his control. There's, a, see, sometimes we're not prideful in every area, just certain areas. And if there's an area that you, you, you say, man, Terry, I need, to, I need to lower myself. The way up is down. I need to lower myself. I need humility in this area of my life. Would you just raise your hands just to God saying, God, I need you to help me in this area. Lord God, we come before you and I pray for all your people here today. And Lord, again, we know that your word is true. And your word says that the way up is down. The way to get ahead in life is not to fight for it, is not to hurt others. The way is the life of humility. And God, I pray you're bringing a humble, just an incredible humility on your people. Lord, we don't have to fight for it. Lord, we don't have to hurt others. Lord, we can treat everyone with respect and love. Lord, knowing that if, if we have humility in our lives, if we're humble before you, Lord God, that you will exalt us in your time. And so I just release the power of this message today. Lord, I pray for testimonies going forward of people who said, man, I just let go and let God have it. I chose to live in humility and God took care of this situation for me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're gonna close with a song. The worship team is gonna do a song and I'll be out there in the lobby and I'd love to, love to greet you, love to talk with you. God bless you, have a great week.